Hello, my name is Chrissy Hodges and today I'm going to do a video on how to talk to people about sexual and violent intrusive thoughts when it comes to OCD or if you just have them in general and you want to talk about them. But first I would like to say, because I'm also going to post this on my YouTube channel, that um, thank you so much for the oh, outpouring of support and love after that video I did for Mental Health on the Mighty. That was a really tough video for me. and. And not only because of what I was going through, but because of, you know, like the, the usual shame and all that crap we go through <laughs> when it comes to not feeling well. So just wanted to say thank you and what an amazing community of people we have. Um, and also sometimes in light of things that go on around the world that sometimes seem, you know, s seem like we all can't meet in the middle somewhere. I just want to say like, it was great to feel the love from all over the world. And I hope that by doing these videos, I'm able to send out some love back to you and say that you're not alone and mental illness affects all of us. Um, and that, uh, yeah, and that recovery is possible. And thanks for joining today. And thank you for being part of my community for OCD. Yay. Um, anyway, so this is an important topic, I think, and uh, one that I've had people request over and over and over. And that is, how do I talk to people about violent and sexual intrusive thoughts. <laughs> you know, there is not really a right answer or a wrong answer to this, but I'm gonna talk a little bit about my experience and how I got to where I'm talking so openly and sometimes very graphic about it. <laughs> I just had a conversation with someone about how I was talking about my dog's red rocket earlier. <laughs> I'm in an earlier video. Anyway, so, um, okay. A lot of you know me as somebody that is just like black about everything that I go through, right? And I just want you to know that it has not always been this way. It took me, it took me eight, 17 years to get to the point where I could be super open about everything and not care. And before that, it took about 14 years where I was even able to talk about having OCD. So I like to always remind people that there is a perspective when it comes to recovery. And everybody's recovery is different. And just because you're not ready to talk to people about your OCD doesn't mean anything about who you are or where you are in recovery. And you don't really ever even have to talk to anybody about it. Um, the people that do speak out like myself and other people, we do it because we're creating a platform. We want you to know that you're not alone and that if anytime you wanna climb up on that platform and join us, yes, we love it, um, but talking about this stuff is personal and it doesn't have to be something that you're aiming to do you know at the end you know in the end all that's where I reach my final recovery I've said this story so many times before and you may have heard it and you're like girl get some more material <laughs> but <laughs> the first time <laughs> when I first realized that I wanted to speak out about what I had been through with the homosexual themed OCD, scrupulosity, fear of vomiting, and my suicide attempt and hospitalization was back when I was 20. It was right after I started to get better in therapy and I was like, oh my gosh, one day I'm gonna speak out loud and maybe my story will help people and OCD was like, Whoosh. like, no you're not, no way. You are never going to because no one will believe you, everyone will judge you, and people will just leave you left and right. So I was like, okay, that was a, a defining moment for me of never speak out loud about this. This type of OCD in general, the sexual and violent intrusive thoughts is super shameful anyway. So we don't like to say it out loud because if we say it out loud, sometimes it makes it real in our mind. Like if I don't say it out loud, maybe I'm really not having them. <laughs> or if I don't say them out loud, or if I do say them out loud, what if that means that they have to be true? So that's where I was for most of my life with OCD. And then when I got the smack down from OCD saying, never tell anybody anything, um, I obeyed. I spent a, over a decade completely silent. I had a humongous scar on my stomach from a suicide attempt and I would never let anyone see it. And I wouldn't even touch it myself because I didn't want that reminder. Um, and I never even, I was even married briefly, if you can believe it. <laughs> yes, and it was brief, sorry. But um, I didn't even tell my husband at the time all of the details of what I had been through because I was so ashamed. 
And I just thought, my biggest fear was, what if no one believes me that this is OCD? What if people really believe that those obsessions are real and I am just in denial? Point one for OCD, or point 10 at that point, you know, OCD was winning yet again. Um, and so I remember, this is one of my favorite stories ever, is my, my best friend, Mike Dwyer, who's up in Steamboat, woo, he's not there now, he's driving to Wyoming. Oh no, he's driving to Wyoming on Monday to see the eclipse, but shout out to Mike Dwyer. Thanks for always being there for me. Um, anyway, he, I finally told him, he was the first person that I told um, after I had gotten through therapy and everything and left college and moved on. <laughs> I made it this like huge production. We, we end up going, to, you know, we're at this bar that we always go to. And I, I say, I have something to tell you. And I'm crying and, he, and we're ordering Budweiser because yes, I did drink Budweiser back in those days. I'm ashamed to say. No offense to anyone who does drink it because I did love it for a long time. But we're ordering Budweiser and I, I'm crying and he's like, what do you have to tell me? You know, he's probably thinking, did you murder someone? Or, you know, did something really bad happen? And I was like, I have OCD and here's the theme that I had. And oh my God, I'm so sorry. And I had a suicide. I'm, I'm like bawling, crying. And he was like, uh, anything else? <laughs> and I said, no. And he was like, so you want to get another round? <laughs> now, I'm not saying that everybody that you tell is going to be blase about it or whatever. And he was definitely interested, but... It just showed me right then that, gosh, we take ourselves and this and, and our themes so personal because they are personal. Because they are not the themes that we would have wished upon ourselves. <laughs> you know, we, we would have wanted anything else. And so we think everybody else is going to feel that shame too. They're going to feel that embarrassment. They're going to feel... They're going to judge themselves the same way we're judging ourselves for having them, right? So even though that was an eye-opener, I still kept my mouth shut for another seven years. <laughs> and I finally, uh, many people have probably heard this, um, hey, Carrie, oh, I, I'm not going to Wyoming, but I will see you next Wednesday. Um, <laughs> um, for, the, you know, for the next seven years, I stayed very quiet. Finally, I relapsed. Not finally going, yay, I relapsed, but I relapsed. And that's when I looked up everything I could online. I couldn't find anything about sexual and violent intrusive thoughts that wasn't just more educational oriented. And I thought, where are all you people out there? I know you're out there because I'm out here and I feel really lonely. And so I just started speaking about it. I went and joined Toastmasters. I learned how to speak. Um, and this is going to get into some of the some of the stuff I really wanted to get in today, which was how do I tell people? And I'm going to kind of follow the timeline here of how I learned to speak. When I first learned to speak about OCD, my goal was to be able to stand up and say, I have sexual intrusive thoughts. This is what pure OCD is. I have had the homosexual theme. I have had scrupulosity. I have had all of this other stuff and, and did not have any shame. Well, yeah, that didn't happen for the first year. <laughs> but <laughs> what did happen is that I learned that you can educate people kind of without throwing yourself under your own bus. Which was, I'm going to tell people about this bizarre disorder and all of the different themes that you can have. And I don't have to tell them what I suffered with. Or I can tell them that I survived a suicide attempt. But I don't have to tell them what that suicide attempt was about. Because that judgment was still there. I was still afraid. And I was still afraid that they may think... Well, if, you know, what if she is erratic or what if these things are true or whatever? So I decided that I would control how much people knew. And here's my rule of thumb. And it still is today. I decided then and there, if I am not ready to take any sort of negativity from other people about what I say, and not cry about it or ruminate about it for 24 hours, then I'm not ready to say it. That was my rule of thumb then. That is my rule of thumb today. Although, y'all know, like, I mean, I don't know what more I can share that isn't <laughs> shocking about <laughs> sexual intrusive thoughts. But it really did serve me well. Why? Because it gave me this platform of where I could grow as someone who is speaking about it. Now, let's take my story and let's inject it in everyday life. 
we're talking about being able to talk about sexual intrusive thoughts, violent intrusive thoughts, blasphemous intrusive thoughts, fear of vomiting, fear of feces, fear of blood, things that just seem really weird to other people. How do we talk to people about that? How do we tell them? This is what I fear and I have been fearing for 24 seven for the last 10 years without worrying about how they're gonna respond. So first let's go to probably the hardest part, family. Now, you may need the support of your family and you may need their financial support or for them to be part of your support system. So this is probably gonna be the hardest. How do I tell my parents that I have sexual intrusive thoughts about them? <laughs> I mean, how do you do that? You know, it's terrifying. Well, the way you can do it is you can provide information the same way that I did on my platform. I'm going to give as much information that is not going to make me ruminate or cry for 24 hours. I mean, you can still cry and ruminate, but... If you live by that rule of thumb, that is, I'm going to tell my family I'm suffering with something, but I don't have to tell them what it is yet. And honestly, if family is pressuring you to tell them your obsession, you have every right to go, right now, I don't feel confident enough to tell you. But when the time is right, I will. This is not because you don't trust them. This is not because you don't trust yourself. This is because we get to decide. And a couple ways that can help with that. Have a peer support, someone like me. This is why peer support is so important. Have a peer, how, 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 <laughs> I just read Sage's comment down here. <laughs> this is the exact reason why you don't necessarily sometimes want to tell people your things. Um, have someone like me, um, someone that does professional peer support, who's been trained, come to talk to your parents with you. So they can say, look, I've had this, this is what I've done. Have your first therapist appointment or a therapist um, that you're seeing, have them talk to your family and say, this is a serious matter. And here are some of the themes. This does not paint the picture that parents don't believe you because it's easy to think that what this does is it legitimizes it on a clinical and medical level of, hey, OCD is a real thing and this is something that we need to take serious and it also shows that you are willing to invest in that therapy, but also standing up for those boundaries of, I am not yet ready to talk about these things that I've been holding in for all of these years. So family, you can get support from a therapist, you can get support from a peer support that can help support you in telling them or just talking to them in general, or another great way is to print out things that are expert advice, ex uh, expert opinions, not opinions, but expert clinical work. The biggest one I can think of off the top of my head is John Hirschfield at OCDBaltimore.com. He has got the most amazing articles. You can print those things off and say, I want you to read these things. These are some of the things that I've been suffering with and I need your support and I'm not ready to talk about it yet. And oh my gosh, it's so okay. And eventually, maybe you will get to that point because once you get far enough in therapy and recovery, you do start to gain some confidence. And you do go, this is OCD and I believe it's OCD now. And I'm able to tell people and not have to feel like if they say anything negative back that it's going to affect me in my recovery. Friends, same thing. You don't have to tell your friends anything. Nothing. On spouse, spouse is lumped in there with family. We know this. Friends, same thing. And uh, I want to I go ahead and say this because friends can sometimes be lumped into sexual intrusive thoughts or violent intrusive thoughts. You know, if a particular person gets around someone and they always feel every time they're around them, they're going to commit violence against them. Or what if, I'm, what if I'm attracted to my friend? I feel like, you know, what if, you know, every time I see my friend, I worry I'm gay. You know, or, if, or, or what if I see my friend and, and I worry that I'm, you know, I get pedophilia thoughts about their child. Things like that. You do not have to tell them because I'm going to tell you something if you're not ready it's not going to liberate you you may think well let me just get it on the table and it might make things better oh, no 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 you're probably going to ruminate about it <laughs> and you're going to worry what they think and then you're going to want their reassurance so here we, we talk about starting a cycle when you're confident and you feel like telling them is more of just, I want to share with you what my experience is. And I want to let you know from an educational standpoint, or, oh my gosh, look what I'm going through or what I've been through. Hell yeah. There you go. 
But to try to, to want to tell someone just because you think you have to, no, 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 don't. You're setting yourself up. I mean, that's the way that I view it. That's the way I've always viewed it in my own world. Um, you to quote Corey Hirsch, it is no one's business what you go with what you go through with OCD. No one's. And so what you choose to disclose to people is completely up to you. Now, if you need someone's support, if you need family or friends or someone else's support in, in the support system or financially or anything, sure, you can absolutely disclose it. But again, use clinical resources that you can print out. Have a therapist talk to that person. Have a peer support come talk to that person. So that way it takes the pressure off you of having to say, these are the exact thoughts I have and I hope you like me anyway because y'all know that's what we do. Y'all know it. So, the last one I want to hit before I talk a little bit about peer support is work. This is, a, this is something that comes up a lot. Should I tell people at work that I have OCD? Do I need to disclose to people at work that I have OCD? Again, I'm just going to reinforce, you don't have to tell anybody anything. If you want to share that, sure, go ahead. If you feel confident enough to talk to people about it, go for it. You know, we are protected, and at least in in our country that you know you can't be discriminated against so there's that but again if you are not willing to hear any sort of negative feedback or anyone saying oh, that's weird I don't really believe you then just don't share it what's the point if you're ready to hear it then go for it because that's how that's that's where I got to and that's how I am I mean people could write on here all day and they do on my YouTube channel sometimes girl you just in the closet <laughs> girl you just in denial I don't care like fine think that but <laughs> it doesn't keep me up at night it, I don't shed tears over it and I certainly don't ruminate and it doesn't throw me another cycle so again your recovery is personal and where you are in your recovery and what you're willing to share is up to you it's no one else's decision the last thing I want to share with you is peer support and why peer I've been talking about this a lot lately. You know I'm a peer supporter. Um, I just did a great thing on OCD stories. Woo! Yeah, you do. Greatest ever. I had so much fun with him. So if you want to check it out, it's OC stories like two episodes ago. I think it's 83 and 84. We had to do a part two because I talk so long. <laughs> I'm scared to look at how long I've been talking now. Just to, <laughs> that will validate like why can't I just stop talking? But anyway, um, I peer support is something that I do to help support people not only find resources in their area um, not only to help find referrals of therapists who might be in their area or those that are able to do teletherapy via Skype either across state lines or across country lines that is something that I help consult with my fees are on my website at christyhodges.com or treatmentforocd.com peer support is something that I do to help support and normalize what people are going through. So you may think, well, whatever, I can go out and read a blog and help normalize it. You absolutely can and please do. Peer support is just real-time support when you don't have the option of seeing a real person or a therapist. <laughs> In between therapist times and psychiatrist times or whatever, I help to support people strategically in between those appointments I help you learn how to talk to people about this condition and help figure out I help support you figure out what your boundaries are and where you feel comfortable and who you feel comfortable talking to these are things that you can talk out with someone who's a peer support that isn't going to advise you of what to do but it's going to help support you in trying to figure that out it is important if someone says they're a peer support to ask them if they have been credentialed in their state I will tell you that um, but for purposes of this video the importance of peer support I would not be here today if it weren't for peer support if it weren't for the people that I have met that have lived with mental illness that understood the shame guilt and embarrassment not only about having mental illness but the symptoms the things that we have done in our life as a result of the illness that have really made us feel like God I'm you know if only I didn't have this or if only that hadn't have happened things would be different talking to someone who just gets it and who can say me too and who, who can help help you look at a plan for recovery because recovery is fluid versus just hey when you get treatment everything's gonna be great 
Or, hey, when you tell your spouse and tell all your family, everything's going to be great. But someone who's been there and who gets it. That's how peer support can help, along with therapy. People who can help advocate for you to the people you love, to people who need to know what you're going through. It is important for people to understand how badly we are tortured because you don't know it. <laughs> people don't know it because our mental compulsions are happening here 10, 12 hours a day sometimes. And you can still be like, hey, what's up? And have a conversation the whole time worrying you're going to stab them. <laughs> you know what I mean? People just don't get it. So being able to talk to someone who gets it, being able to process things with their peer support, um, which is very different from therapy, but also having a therapist or a peer support help advocate for you to the people that you need the support from, learn how to talk about it. It is imperative and it can help. It can help so much. So that's what I wanted to say today. Um, and I, I just wanted to um, tell you that, I want to reinforce what I said about Corey Hirsch. I'm going to go at home again, is that, is that Telling people about OCD is totally up to you and sometimes it's none of people's business. And that's okay too. It doesn't mean that you can't trust people and it doesn't mean that you're ashamed to tell people, but you know what? Maybe you're not ready. I get to pick and choose every day who I engage in in conversations about OCD. You know, I can I can pick and choose what I want to say to certain crowds. I talk to the Denver Sheriff's Department every month. Do you actually think I'm going to go up there and bust up with like all the details of having homosexual OCD? No. <laughs> I gauge my audience. Remember, my rule of thumb is I'm not going to say too much. I'm not going to say something that's going to cause me to cry all day or that's going to cause me to ruminate. I have made mistakes and have done that. But at the same time, this is your recovery with OCD. You get to choose, you get to be the person that decides who knows and how much they know. And you never, ever have to feel bad about that. So thank you for joining me today. I hope this was helpful at all. And also I just again want to give a shout out of all the love that I received after going through a bit of a hard time. I am doing so much better. Um, I used the tools of ERP. I used a medication to help. And I was able to push through a cycle that sucks, but this is what we go through with OCD. But we are not alone, and I am here to tell you that across the world, you are not alone. Recovery is possible for everyone. Thank you. Love you. Bye.